we have talked about transfer function and now we are introducing state space models. It's very easy to go from one way to another. It's easy to go from state space to transfer function. And then we're going to talk about it here. What we'll talk about next time is the reverse is not as trivial. So if you just know the transfer function, but you want to go to understand, understand the state space model, then it's less trivial. In a way, this is saying that the state space model is actually containing more information than the transfer function. You can go from one side to another easily, but backwards is more difficult. So let's talk about the easy thing first. Let's talk about continuous time system first. We have talked about this general LTI description of a continuous time state space model, derivative of x and um, uh, y is cx plus du. We also know from transfer function logic, we can describe the system using convolution. If I know the input is a one-dimensional input, and then the output is one-dimensional output, then the system is single input, single output system. We can have a transfer function relationship between u and y. And that relationship is described by the convolution. So y is g, the impulse response, of the transfer function system convoluted with the input u defined by this convolution formula. In the Laplace domain, this is how it relates the transfer function. g uh, is the transfer function between u and y. We learned Laplace transform, so we can easily derive from based on these state space models, we can derive how the input u corresponds to the output y from the state space models. This is going entirely from the convolution approach, but we can derive the same from the state space model. Let's do that. If we go from the Laplace transform of the state space formula, then the language is quite straightforward. The only thing we need to pay attention to, again, is the dimension now. Laplace transform of s, of derivative of x, is s times the x of s minus the initial condition, right? If it's a vector, it doesn't matter. If this is a vector, x is a vector, I want to derive the Laplace transform of this vector is going to be the Laplace, let's say, x1, x2. Then it's the Laplace transform of x1 and Laplace transform of x2. So it's still a vector. Doesn't, doesn't change, doesn't create challenges to do this step. This is s, xs minus the initial condition. And then on the right-hand side is a, a matrix, times the Laplace transform of x plus bu. Same thing, y is uh, just copy, just change yt with ys, xt with xs, and dt with ut with us, capital us. Then these are all the transfer function domain, s domain properties. What needs to be a little bit careful to derive the relationship between u and y is we don't need to know x in the transfer function. So just eliminate x. So I can do s from the first equation. si minus a x of s equal to x0 plus b u of s. This is going to give me how x depends on the input u. Then y of s is going to be, so xs is this matrix, this is a matrix, be careful. This is a matrix. So xs is this matrix inverse, multiply the inverse of this matrix on 
both right hand side and right left hand side and right hand side then we are going to get s i we are going to get c times x of s which is x i minus a inverse x zero plus b u of s plus d u of s It equals C S I minus A inverse X zero plus C S I minus A inverse B U S plus D U S. That's how Y looks like in the Laplace domain. It depends on the initial condition. It depends on the input. Now, if the initial condition is 0, then we have the relationship between y and u, which is this matrix plus d. So it's c, s, i minus a, b plus d. That's the transfer function. All right? We always let the initial condition to be 0 if I just want to know the transfer function between the input and output. So the concept is transfer function is de describing the relationship between input and output. So it shouldn't depend on the system initial, res initial condition. No matter how you start the system, the input-output relationship should not change. This is good for linear systems. For nonlinear systems, is not the case. So nonlinear systems has more complexities. This is continuous time systems. Discrete time system is exactly the same thing. So one step advance is z times x of z, and then a z b u. A Z B U and then Y is Y Z C X D plus D U. So all these are exactly the same. Again, if the initial condition is zero, you get the relationship between U and Y. It's exactly the same formula, very similar to each other. So the transfer function is the same. Formula for transfer function is the same. Any questions? Yes? Uh, the right side of this equation is, is a matrix, right? Which one? This equation? Yes. OK. And what is the left hand side? You said an equation. Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is here. You are, you are predicting what I'm going to teach. Let's take some analysis. These are matrices. We talked about that, right? So A is a square matrix. So you have to have, if x is a vector, and then uh, on the left hand side, this is a vector of the same dimension. You have to be a square matrix to make this matrix multiplication work. If x is n by 1, if let's say this is n by 1, this is also n by 1, then your A matrix should be n by n. And then if your input u, let's say the simple case is a scalar, it's one by one. Then what should my dimension of b be? It should be a vector, n by one. Now the same thing, let's say consider the case if my output is one by one, then because my input x is n by one, my C matrix should be one by n. And then D should be a scalar, if U is a scalar. So that's the dimension of the system parameters. The formula that we derived are C, S, I minus A inverse B plus D. A is n by n, so this whole thing is going to be n by n. B is n by 1. 
and C is 1 by N. So this looks like 1 by N matrix, a long matrix, a wide matrix, multiplying a square matrix, and then a vector, a skinny matrix, plus D is a scalar. So in this case, is G a scalar or a vector? Scalar, right? So this is a scalar transfer function. If my input is one dimension, my output is also one dimension. It's going to be different, as you can imagine, if my input is two dimension and my output is two dimension. But the same logic will apply. So that's the first observation answers your question. And then the second observation is there's no way to go to, to have ambiguities in this, in this computation. If you give me A, B, C, D, then the result is fixed. So once A, B, C, D is given, G is given. G is unique. All right, so then it comes to the question, the formula is very nice. It's, you can imagine the difference between this model and uh, the long ordinary differential equation model, right? The formula is amazingly simple. Then the evils are in these details. The details are you need to compute an inverse here. All the others are very easy. So you need to do this inverse matrix computation. So <coughs> let's review, take a quick look about computing matrix inversions. Let's start with a general concept and then give some specific examples. So you can compute a matrix inversion, let's say A, B, C, D, two by two. You can compute this matrix inversion very quickly by some formulas. Before that, uh, be very careful. These matrices, they are all square matrices. If the matrix is not square, it doesn't make sense to compute the inverse. So for this two by two matrix, the inverse is, this is a formula, is one over the determinant AD minus BC times DA negative B negative C. This is for a two by two matrix. There are these formulas available. So compute the determinant, which is the diagonal multiplication minus the off-diagonal multiplication, AD minus BC. And then uh, the little matrix, the right-hand side matrix, is going to be, for the first one, you sort of stand here, remove this column, remove the row and the column that uh, you are standing with. Then this is the remaining, so put D here. For this element here, stand at this position, remove what you see in the row and what you see in the column, then this is A remaining, so put A here. And then for this element here, this element here, if you want to know this element in this matrix, stand in the transpose position. So if you want to know what is happening here, stand in this position and then remove these row and columns and you're getting a B. And it's, uh, the, the index is going to be negative based on the, uh, this, this negative one comes from the index. So this B is at the first row, second column, right? Position is that. So this negative one is because it's one plus two. That's how it is computed. These are for two-dimensional matrices. For three-dimensional matrices, there are these similar technologies. For three-dimensional matrices are one over the determinant of the matrix, multiplying this so-called adjoint matrix. So the determinant of a three-by-three three matrix is, if I'm, if, let's do here, the determinant of a three-by-three three matrix is determinant of this one is diagonal computation C11, C12, C22, C33 
plus diagonal off diagonal one time times C31 plus off diagonal twice times C21, C32 minus the computation from this diagonal from the cross diagonal multiplications. All right, so is this diagonal mon multiplications? So these formulas are all available from the internet. We mostly do two dimensional and three dimensional. So this is a concept. The adjoint matrix, there are specific components that need to be computed. I want you guys to take a look at the slide and then we're going to talk about these detailed computations with some examples next time.